Hi, I'm Earl Silverman, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Rheumatology. Hope you all are doing well and healthy, and I've been healthy during the second wave of the coronavirus pandemic. Today, I'm pleased to talk to Dr. Adam Fay, who's a gastroenterologist at New York Presbyterian Columbia, University Irving Medical Hospital. I've got that out of right. And Mount Sinai Hospital, New York. Dr. Fay, along with his colleagues from New York Presbyterian Columbia University, Irving Medical Center, Mount Sinai Hospital, New York, and New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell Medical College, New York, wrote an article entitled Risk of Adverse Outcomes in Hospitalized Patients with Autoimmune Disease and COVID 19, a match cohort study from New York City, which we will discuss today with Dr. Fay. Adam, I want to thank you and your colleagues for writing this article, examining the risk of adverse outcome in autoimmune disease with COVID-19. I want to thank you for putting up with me. Of course. Thanks for having me. Okay, so first of all, do you want to please highlight the important findings and conclusions of your article? So this was, uh, you know, this was a study that was happening during the first portion of the pandemic. Uh, from March 1st to April 15th, and we were very interested in the question that um, do autoimmune or immune-mediated disease patients with these autoimmune or immune-mediated diseases, does that actually confer an increased risk of intubation, uh, ICU admission, or death, again, among those who are hospitalized? So there had been studies, and over the past few months, there have been some studies looking at predominantly outpatient populations, registry studies, but not really much looking at hospitalized patients. So if you're sick enough to come to the hospital, does having an autoimmune or immune-mediated condition actually confer an additional risk? So we started off with looking at just um, different levels of illness when patients come to the hospital. So we looked at vital signs and lab values and wanted to ask the question, do patients with autoimmune or immune-mediated diseases have differences when they're first hitting the emergency room? And Actually, looking at symptoms, looking at vital signs, including oxygen requirements and, and laboratory values, including some of the inflammatory um, components like ESR, CRP, IL-6, we actually didn't see a significant difference between the two groups. Now, so I should say our hypothesis during um, kind of this time was that immune-mediated diseases might actually confer an increased risk given that COVID-19, um, you know, had this cytokine storm and inflammatory component, our worry was that with immune dysregulation, this actually might be upregulated. So we looked at this, we actually had 62 uh, patients with autoimmune disease or immune mediated diseases. We did an age and sex match control from two to one. And we looked at a composite outcome of ICU, intensive care unit admission, uh, intubation and death. And we actually found that patients with immune mediated disease or autoimmune disease actually did not have a significantly higher likelihood of having that composite outcome or those individual outcomes. And this was even held up on multivariable analysis when controlling for some factors such as smoking and BMI. Um, we also wanted to look at length of stay, which we didn't see a difference between, again, patients with autoimmune or immune mediated diseases and those without. And we also wanted to look at time to in hospital death. So, the thought being maybe we're not seeing worse outcomes, but maybe our immune mediated or autoimmune disease patients are actually having an earlier or later death. We actually didn't see any significant differences between the two groups, which was again, very comforting for our patients, for us in helping us guide management, especially as we're now in the midst of the second wave, kind of helps um, put things into a little perspective for us. It's very good to have your article because when, you, when I speak to my colleagues in other countries, much are higher harder hit than Canada, they seem to imply the same thing that doesn't seem to be worse, which is very comforting. Very comforting. And, yeah. and therapy also, which I think is, you know, there's been a lot of question, what do we tell our patients? Do we hold biologic therapy? Yeah. Should they be on steroids? Should they not as outpatients? And I, I think, you know, from this data and from a lot of other data, um, which have really predominantly looked at this, it seems at least maybe outpatient corticosteroid use might increase risk of worse outcomes, but at least biologic use, so Humira, which is adalimumab, and some of the others, especially we use in inflammatory bowel disease, don't really seem to confer a much higher risk of adverse outcomes, which again is, is really great news for us, for our patients, so that they don't have to stop therapies, potentially have a flare of their disease, need hospitalization for that, and so forth. No, I agree. It was, that's why I think this was really important. 
One thing that struck me though is a rheumatologist, not a gastroenterologist, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Yeah. It made sense to me that approximately 25% of your 62 patients had RA, but almost 13% had sarcoidosis. Now, either you guys have the weirdest practice, but it was, you know, two some three really large hospitals. Any hypothesis of why you saw so many sarcoidosis patients? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I'll try to answer as a gastroenterologist, <laughs> so with a grain of salt. Um, I think it probably comes down to one of two things, if not both, maybe a third. But I think pathophysiology-wise, um, at least there was a recent um, study from Sinai, I think, looking primarily just at sarcoidosis. And they, they showed that patients with sarcoidosis aren't at higher risk for adverse outcomes. Um, that being said, patients with sarcoidosis and lung disorders or some kind of pulmonary compromise, either from sarcoidosis or not, seem to have worse outcomes. So, you know, in our cohort, we did have, um, I think, eight patients or so with sarcoidosis. I think at least half actually had some pulmonary disease, whether part of their sarcoidosis or not. Um, and then I think the second component is you know, being at large tertiary academic centers like these, I think we get a lot of referrals. So we have we do have a large, at least at Columbia University, um, where this is predominantly done, we have a large cardiac sarcoid unit. Uh, we do see pulmonary sarcoid patients there. And obviously with the encatchment area, especially during the first wave, a lot of patients with um, you know, diseases that maybe providers were uncomfortable managing as an outpatient were telling them to at least come in. So it might be a a kind of a mix of those two things, but it is it is an interesting finding. It, it'd be interesting to now look during the second wave and see if that's actually held up or not. Yeah, I'm gonna now when I read the article, so it's five weeks to look at other centers. Like, is it unique for the referral bias? You why? So another question that struck me too was the difference in the ethnicities. I mean, we all know about non-Caucasians getting worse disease for many many reasons. But why the difference, which I try to think of was it the incidence and all that can think of, in RA maybe, okay? Right. But lupus it flips, and a lot of the R, other autoimmune diseases, in fact, and I don't know about inflammatory bowel disease. I think it's more Caucasian, isn't it? Right. Well, there is, we do see at least at our center, it's funny, we do see um, a lot of Ashkenazi Jewish patients, so right. more Caucasian. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's a little bit difficult to say based on our study because we weren't really able to assess this. So it's, it's an incredibly important topic, obviously, with ethnic variations and infection risk of COVID-19 and, and outcomes. Um, this was a retrospective electronic health record study kind of looking back. So we're unfortunately, we're kind of limited by that, um, that limitation, I'll say. Um, a lot of data, so about 20 to 25 percent of ethnicity is actually missing in the EHR, and it's also not able to be verified. So, you know, we wanted to ideally match on age, sex, and ethnicity, but the ability to con confirm that this is accurately, uh, accurately verified and then having 20 to 25 percent of missing data, it's, it's unclear how that would shift the balance of things. So we you know, it's it's a little bit hard to say, and unfortunately, our study wasn't really able to assess yeah. that. Well, the, I guess the good and the bad news is sort of hypothesis generating, but hopefully, we won't get a third wave to test it. I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> that would be exactly. I think yes, absolutely. It, certainly, moving forward and doing more prospective studies with COVID nineteen, this is something that should be tackled and uh, assessed and captured within the EHR, but. I'm hoping after this, we have a vaccine. We're, we're hopefully going to be winding exactly. down. I hope it's a good question. Exactly. <laughs> I hope so too. My final question is that, you know, the inpatient treatment um, with hydroxychloroquine and new initiation of corticosteroids, associated adverse outcome. I, I realize that certainly, particularly in the United States, not so much in Canada, to be honest, yeah. we didn't jump on the hydroxychloroquine Welcome bandwagon early. Um, we didn't have our prime minister telling us it's the best thing since chicken soup, you know, or sliced bread. So, so how has it changed 
the treatment now. In Europe. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we certainly jumped on the bandwagon here in the, the U.S. I mean, I think at some points there were even shortages in hydroxychloroquine right. for patients that even needed it um, because of this. So it's, it's interesting. Certainly things have changed, at least with this second wave. So I think no longer are we really using hydroxychloroquine and even steroid usage has changed a bit. So I think in the first wave, you know, we were really trying to figure out what, if anything, would be helpful for our patients. Um, and really, hydroxychloroquine steroids uh, were being used, but really a little bit indiscriminately in the sense that there wasn't a standardized protocol on who was getting corticosteroids, um, what dose were they getting it at for how long, et cetera. So, you know, in our study, what we saw was that the patients getting <clears throat> hydroxychloroquine and steroids or having worse outcomes, but this was likely because the you know providers reaching for these therapies have more sick or sicker patients. In I mean, that's one of the problems retrospectively is confounding by indication. So. Exactly, and I think that's also what uh, there was a recent editorial I think in the New England Journal by Dr. Fauci arguing for you know need for just continued RCTs because a lot of retrospective data, as much as you try to adjust for confounding and and, you know, it, it's still present and there's still unmeasured confounding within there. Um, but now with the second wave, it's interesting because we're no longer using hydroxychloroquine. We're using more budesonide now at a set dose, generally around six milligrams, basically for patients who are on oxygen or ventilator dependent. And this is um, in stark contrast, when you look back at the first wave, we only had about 25% of patients um, within the data really getting corticosteroids, and this was, a, uh, this was a, uh, a paper from my colleague who looked at Columbia University of the critically ill in the Lancet, and only about 25% of them were getting corticosteroids. So that has vastly changed right now, and how that's going to impact um, outcomes is interesting. I don't, I don't think it will shift to the point where all of a sudden immune-mediated or autoimmune diseases will confer an, an elevated risk or anything of that nature, but it'll it will be interesting to see how patients um, do with more standardized therapy. And, you know, we'll have more robust data now to at least take another look at this. Yeah, we hope we, hope we learn by our experience. Absolutely. So, I want to thank you. So is there anything you'd like to add that maybe we missed? Yeah, of course. I, first, I want to thank you all for having me so much. Um, this was a real uh, an honor and a pleasure. Um, I think one thing to remind kind of the uh, viewers and the readers is that we, again, we really wanted to look at hospitalized patients. So in order to do that, and we kind of talked about this a little bit, but we had to kind of uh, take a, many autoimmune or immune mediated diseases and kind of put them all together in order to have a more uh, you know, robust power analysis. In doing so, I think we you know, have a very large hospitalized cohort where we can say something. Um, the other, on the other side, we can't take a look at individual diseases. So I do think it's important as we move forward, unfortunately, in the second wave to continue efforts looking particularly at rheumatoid arthritis, sarcoidosis, inflammatory bowel disease, and really taking a deep dive into each of these immune-mediated or autoimmune diseases and seeing what the risk of each confers, how the therapies within each differ uh, in terms of their overall risk profiles, et cetera. So, you know, it's a, it's a, one of those things where it's very difficult, obviously, to get a large hospitalized cohort of uh, you know, patients with potentially rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's disease or sort of colitis. But now, unfortunately, with the second wave, we may have more data where we can actually take a, a more robust look at this and, and see what kind of individual risk there is. Yeah, I think what's happened certainly in the rheumatology are very <clears throat> Excuse me, very large consortium, which is a European consortium and North American or, or US wide. And that's the only way to do it. I mean, yeah. otherwise, your numbers individually are anecdotal. And exactly. you have to be, and I think, so that's what I think we're in a better position to study it. And hopefully, it will be said, oh, look, look what happened in the past. Exactly. I think that's exactly right. I mean, the first wave hit. I mean, to be honest, all of us a bit by surprise, we were scrambling to understand the disease, what to do. Um, now, treatments are more standardized. I think the way we're documenting things is more standardized. And really, 
now is the time to be setting up. And same in the GI world and in the inflammatory bowel disease world, celiac disease, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, there's been more international recognition and consortiums coming together to really focus on these specific diseases and understand and take a deep dive within there. So, you know, I think that's a positive. Unfortunately, you know, we need to be doing it because we're in a second wave, but at least now we, we're kind of primed to be able to do this. Well, on that, I guess, bright note, I want to thank okay. you for taking the time to talk to me for a very interesting, lightning conversation. And all the listeners, please read the full-length article, Risk of Adverse Outcomes in Hospitalized Patients with Autoimmune Disease and COVID-19, a match cohort study from New York City, as well as our other editorials, articles, and letters about the SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 effects and implications for rheumatologists, rheumatology practices, and even gastroenterologists now. Yeah. So if you have any comments or questions, please send Please message us at Twitter at jroom or email us at manuscripts at jroom.com. And thank you for joining us. And please follow the guidelines of regional and national health authorities and be sure to maintain social distancing in order to stay safe. And hope we all will be vaccinated soon. Like yes. Adam has. Oh, hopefully. Yep. Just received the second. And thanks for letting a gastroenterologist, I'll say, crash the, uh, the rheumatology party. That's okay. Every so often, I have to feel a little uncomfortable, not a deal. Absolutely. Thanks, Adam. Thanks so much for having me.